This is Let's Talk Business with your host, Mark Ebinger. Now, here's Mark. Welcome to Let's Talk Business, a show that highlights and promotes entrepreneurs to learn more about their vision, goals, and marketing strategy. We also highlight local nonprofits that work to improve the community. Coming up on the show today, we're going to learn about human traffic interdiction efforts here in the San Antonio area. In studio with us today is Carl McMichael, the Executive Director of Human Traffic in Interdiction at the BCFS Health and Human Services. Carl, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. I'm your host, Mark Evinger, the owner of Krukus Virtual Staffing, a company that specializes in hiring virtual assistants from outside the United States. I'm Kian Frith, co-host, and I am the CEO of KV Impact Consulting. We're a boutique professional services firm doing CFO consulting and cyber specialists. You also have a guest here in the studio, right? Did you bring somebody with you today? I did bring someone very special with me in the studio today. My youngest son, who's little eight-year-old Benjamin, come over from the UK, here for 10 days on vacation in the US for the very first time. Oh, his first trip, and he comes here to the Alamo City. Are you going to take him down and see the Alamo? Oh, we'll get, be going to see the Alamo. We've got a number of things planned for this next 10 days. We'll keep him going. Nice. So love it. We'll just give him a little bit of a chance just to break in gentle. Mm-hmm. Saturday, he was struggling a little bit with a bit of jet lag, but um, yeah, we'll get there. How many hours ahead is the UK? Um, as from this weekend, six. Six hours. Okay. So, That's not too bad. Yeah. It was nine, 19 hours of travel on Friday, though, so Yikes. it was a long day. All right, nothing a little caffeine and candy won't fix, right? Well, lo- <laughs> lots of candy and lots of movies. Right. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I know he's a Hulk fan, apparently. Uh, oh, loves Marvel. Yeah. All right. And Sasquatch. A quick reminder to follow the Let's Talk Business podcast on all major podcast platforms and social media where you can catch video versions of the show. You can get to everything easily from our website at satalkradio.com. Now, if you're going to be in the San Antonio area on Thursday, May 16th, be sure to join us at the next Let's Talk Business Mega Mixer. We're expecting 150 local business owners and entrepreneurs on site to mix, mingle, and connect with each other to do some more business. You can get to all the information on our website at satalkradio.com. A quick shout out to our... Bear me. Come on. No, no. 150. We're expecting a lot more than that. Well, we yeah. are talking about a mega mixer. Yeah. Based on the fact that our first mixer was a resounding success. Yeah, we had 150. This next one, seriously, you need to be there. If, if you weren't the last one, you need to be at this one. Yeah, there's a, quite a few people I've talked to that didn't make the first one. They're like, they're definitely planning on going to the second one because they heard that it was quite the success. So uh, we're working it's on talk of the town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You went there last time, were you, Cara? You, you were. I was. Yeah. What did you think? It was great. What'd you like about it? Love the location. Yeah, that was a great location. How about the host? I mean, the host was great too. Of I heard. course. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> I mean, that goes what? without saying, right? But the co-hosts were better. Uh, they were okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I like I like you even more, Kara. I mean, the host tends to wear bespoke attire, so yeah. I just haven't worn it today. I was wearing behind <laughs> schedule. So. Yeah. You are a little casual. Just saying. I'm. I'm yeah. I'm. So I'm getting more Texan. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, uh, let's see. A quick shout out to Adam Ross Custom, one of the gold sponsors of our upcoming Let's Talk Business Mega Mixer on uh, May 16th. Uh, Adam Ross Custom is a luxury band providing bespoke and custom garments through expert design, impeccable craftsmanship, and the finest quality fabrics. I got to tell you, it does feel good and it looks good too. Don't you think? Is it, yeah, it's looking pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, it's pretty good. <laughs> All right, so if you're looking for that. Lining. If you're, we, should, we should work more on the uh, mm-hmm. the banter. If you're looking for that perfect custom business suit, reach out to Heather Wren at Adam Ross Custom here in the San Antonio area. Be sure to let Heather know that Mark from the Let's Talk Business podcast sent you, and she'll hook you up with a free custom shirt to go with the new suit. Reach out to Heather Wren at Adam Ross Custom by visiting their website at adamrosscustom.com or calling 713-221-4217. That's 713-221-4217. All right, so Carl, we met at a mixer, and, and you're really getting the word out in the local business community about your your guys' efforts with respect to human trafficking here in the San Antonio area, which I was a cop here in San Antonio for 24 years, and I didn't, don't know much about that. I mean, I retired back in 2018, but the fact that this has probably been an issue for a lot longer than, uh, a lot earlier than 2018, I'm sure, but it's not really anything I heard of. So let's start with a little bit of your background and how you ended up there um, in, in this career field? Hmm. Uh, kind of by chance, actually. I, uh, I grew up working in the political realm, uh, working at the state capitol, and then uh, also worked in D.C. Uh, but during my time in Washington, D.C., back in the early 2000s, uh, it's when I first learned about the issue of human trafficking. 
we didn't really pass major human trafficking legislation until 1999. Uh, the Palermo Protocols came through the United Nations. And then after that, uh, on the federal level, we passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And then the states started following. Uh, in fact, Texas really started passing their first legislation in about 2001, 2003. Uh, so I learned about the issue of human trafficking, got really involved uh, in some awareness efforts. And then when I came back to Texas, uh, right at uh, 2003, 2004, from D.C., it might have been 2005, it's all running together. Uh, but the very first uh report that landed on my desk when I went back to work in the state legislature was uh, Texas response to human trafficking. And the first thing that I noticed is everything was focusing on the international victims and not on domestic victims. And yet I knew that had to be a larger population, even though there, there really wasn't a lot of awareness about it. So I started working on uh, policy and wrote a lot of very foundational pieces of legislation for Texas uh, over the course of a couple of different legislative sessions and um, got really involved in helping to set up the very first trafficking prevention, uh, statewide trafficking prevention task force that operates out of the attorney general's office. That's now become a model for, for multiple other states. And then I started advising other states on legislation and even a couple of countries before I went back to DC, uh, spent another, um, right at eight years as a chief of staff in Congress, uh, still working on trafficking policy as well as uh, a number of other issues, and uh, needed to come back home and got recruited uh, by BCFS Health and Human Services to come launch their Human Trafficking Interdiction Division. And so that's how I ended up here right at four years ago. So what drives you to do this type of work? Is it, uh, I mean, was there some a personal reason, or is it just this is a good fit for you professionally? You get a lot of joy out of the work. I mean, what's the deal there? Well, there's it's hard to find joy when you're surrounded by horror, but uh, very much of that starfish principle. You know, it, it matters to the starfish that you throw back into the water. You, are you familiar with that story? No. You're walking down a beach. Uh, you see a starfish. You toss it in the water. Keep walking. You see another starfish. You toss it back into the water, and somebody comes along and says. There's a million starfish that have made their way out of the water. Well, you're wasting your time. You're not going to catch them all. The, the response is, well, I might not catch them all, but it matters to this one. And and so that's very much a, a driver for, for everything that I've ever done. Uh, there's a, a passage in the scripture that talks about the need to be the watchman on the wall. And your, your response as that watchman is to sound the alarm. And if you sound the alarm and nobody responds, then their blood is on their hands. But if you don't sound the alarm, then their blood is on your hands. So everything that I've done my entire life has been with that mission motivation, you know, the, the desire, the need to, to push forward, to, to sound the alarm, to raise uh, the cry, and, and to represent those who have no voice. So, but when somebody is successfully brought out of mm -hmm. that environment, there's no joy in that or there absolutely is. So there's the joy. I was there's talking the joy. About. Yes, absolutely. So finding that joy, I think is critical to our own personal, of course, you know, psychology, mm -hmm. you know, um, otherwise it would be depressing on a regular basis and you're just constantly being dragged under, you know what I mean? So well, um, this, this is a, an issue that can bog you down with the horror and with, and with all kinds of depressing statistics and whatnot. So we have to, it's why I refer back to the starfish. We have to find the joy in the starfish. We have to find the joy in the one and, and in the small successes that for most people probably don't seem like successes, but for us are monumental. And I don't know if small is the right word there because they're massive success. They are. One person are. being brought out of that environment and given a chance at a, at a great life. It's huge. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That's no small feat there. Um, so I... I I definitely see the huge upside of what you're doing because even if it only happened one time in your career, that's still a massive win. But I know it would happen a lot more than that. Do you follow these cases from from early on all the way through to where they are now? They're free of that situation and then be able to stay in contact with them. What, what's that look like for for a number of them? Yes, uh, we often develop really strong relationships with with the various survivors and uh, our. Our programming is designed to be 24-7, 365. We are there 
or someone is there. There's always a live person at the end of a text or at the end of, of a phone call, uh, regardless of the hour, regardless of the, of the day. And, uh, and we walk with them through everything. You know, when we first get referrals, more often than not, they're still in the life. And so it's about empower, empowering the survivor to be able to make the decision to leave on their own. Uh, we can't force that scenario. You, know, the, you have a, a number of people who think that you can go in and you can save them, you can rescue them, you know, pull them out of, a, out, of, out of a bad situation, and immediately they're on the road to recovery. And that's, that's just not the case. Uh, it's a very different type of environment um, in the sense that you are, you're dealing with a lot of the emotional ties, you know, much like Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, sure. the, the story of Stockholm Syndrome is uh, a bank robbery that, that took place over the course of about four or five days with adults who were held hostage in a bank. And 20 plus years later, those hostages are still maintaining contact with the robbers sitting in prison. That's, that's how we got the concept of Stockholm Syndrome. Now imagine being a child who's gone through all kinds of trauma, uh, and they're bonded now to the individual who is, who is providing that trauma, who's creating that trauma in their life. So breaking that tie is very difficult. You also develop trauma bonds with those who are in the life with you. And so leaving them, that survivor guilt of leaving them is, is often also very, very difficult. And of course, when you come out of that, there's nobody else around you who understands, who knows what that's like, who can relate to what you've been through. And especially if you are a child, you have this weird dichotomy of being stunted in your emotional growth. And so very, very childlike. And yet at, by the same token, you're also very old and, and hardened because of what you have experienced and been through. And you've had a life that doesn't include bondage, doesn't include being trapped, doesn't include being handcuffed to, I mean, all of the things that Hollywood shows you is, is not the norm. You know, they're not handcuffed to a bed. They're not locked behind you know, closed doors. They're not uh, imprisoned. Uh, it's, a, it's a mental trap, much more so than a physical uh, trap or bondage. And so they're more accustomed to having significantly more freedom than traditionally what they'll get when they come back to a home that wants to naturally close in and protect them. And, and so it's, it's very difficult, and it's not uncommon for uh, those who've been exploited to run back uh, an average of seven times uh, before they finally choose to truly leave on their own. Wow. Mm. That, that's incredible. I, as I'm sitting here listening to this and, and hearing about the human trafficking, I'm thinking back, and obviously as an Englishman, very aware of like Will, William Wilberforce and the efforts that he put into um, end slavery. Um, and when I think of human trafficking, I think of slavery. Mm -hmm. But well, hearing what, but hearing what you've just said there, um, you go much further though with your, your definition. H how would you define human trafficking now in this modern age compared to maybe how Wilberforce saw it sure. all those years ago? You still see much of those same elephant uh, elements. You you definitely have people who are sold over and over and over and over again, uh, but. Traditionally, we break down trafficking uh, in the United States into commercial sex or forced labor. Uh, other places around the world, you'll see organ trafficking as part of, of the trafficking aspect uh, and, and a few other things. I mean, um, for example, the, the forced uh, military, you know, where you've got child soldiers in, in particular, that dovetails into the forced labor. You know, so it kind of breaks down into those two primary categories. Uh, with commercial sex, you're being sold over and over and over again, often multiple times in one day. With forced labor, you are creating uh, the, the cash flow by saving money more so than being sold repetitively. Uh, it's not uncommon um, to be trafficked out of your own home. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing significantly more of that than what we used to. And part of that is because we're getting better at identifying the problem. Uh, but part of it is, uh, I, I genuinely, I, I think it's uh, anytime the economy gets really bad, uh, people get desperate. And, uh, and when they get desperate, they will do whatever it takes to survive. And unfortunately, that often means um, 
or that can mean exploiting your own children? Just picking up on something you just said there at the end there, I'm just thinking about where the US is right this, at this moment. I'm going through this year and a lot of uncertainty. Are you kind of gearing yourselves up for there to be a lot more, like a rise in human trafficking this year? as opposed to in previous years? We have seen a, a marked increase um, really since the early days of COVID. Uh, and part of that is, uh, particularly when, when we're looking at uh, child sex trafficking, which mm. is our largest program. You know, We have multiple programs that ultimately work with all ages and all forms of trafficking. But our largest program by far is a, a program called Common Thread that works in, in Texas, uh, up to the age of 25, and in Louisiana, where we are uh, statewide, it, it works up to the age of 18. And with commercial sex, the thing that we that we saw for our children is we took them out of the classroom, right? We put them online on all these tablets. We we isolated them from their peers, and that created its own form of neglect. So even when you had a happy, healthy home, which not everybody did. Uh, but even if you did have a happy and healthy home, you created a form of neglect that parents were didn't understand um, through no fault of their own. They just didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of parents weren't paying attention to what was happening online. And unfortunately, those who are willing to exploit our children are very skilled and they are very quick to transition to whatever the laws or the medium or whatever is available and uh, our kids are being accessed through social media they're being accessed through roblox you know the gaming platform anything that creates an interactive platform is a way in which all of these lovely bots start communicating and then they will they will then contact as soon as somebody responds they'll contact them and they'll start mimicking the language in terms of uh, the way in which they talk. And then they develop these relationships. And then through the development of the relationship, they start to isolate from family and friends. Like, nobody will ever understand you like I do. I can't believe they did that to you. What were they thinking? They just don't get you. Uh, and develop often either a very, very close personal relationship or a very close romantic relationship to then pull them out of the house. And so our kids leave for what they think is this amazing relationship and they leave willingly but then that relationship turns into a horror show uh, it's not really all that dissimilar from a domestic violence type of scenario where you wonder why doesn't that person who's being abused leave well they can't because they're so emotionally tied you have to break that bond before then they they're willing to leave again sure. so our kids aren't identifying as being trafficked because they went willingly right they went uh, into something that they thought was this great relationship that ended up not being. And they think, well, it's going to get better because there's a lot of that manipulation mm -hmm. uh, that tells you it will, but it never really does. And then they see what's in Hollywood, which frankly does a disservice to, to the industry because that's not what any of them, 99%, it's, it's not what 99% of them experience. And so then the next question is, well, am I then guilty of my own abuse? Am I responsible for this because I left to go into this? So it's there's a lot of issues that we have to work through and uh, and not the least of which is learning how to make decisions again uh, and learning that they can make positive and healthy decisions for their life. And so that's that's part of what we do. But, but then that, that power of um, grooming, essentially. Absolutely. I mean, I work in cyber risk. I understand that the power of social engineering with adults and so you take children who, who aren't as mature, they're not aware of what's going on and very easy to, mm -hmm. to trick them, you know? And I find it shocking to hear that children would maybe blame themselves for getting that position. I mean, that, that's horrific. Well, you it's, know? it's also what they've been taught. I mean, that's, sure. again, part of the grooming process. Sure. The, the other thing that we see um, quite a bit, you know, you mentioned AI, so it, it prompted that. Uh, it takes one photograph or nine seconds of video to create whatever you want. And so what we're seeing is these predators creating child sexual abuse material, uh, child porn, and then they will send it and then they will demand what we now refer to as sextortion. 
by saying, I will put this on your Facebook page so that everybody can see it. I will put it on your school network. Uh, all, all, I will release it to your family and your friends unless you send me photos along those lines. And so then it creates this spiral, which is also commercial sexual trafficking. Uh, and unfortunately, we are seeing a growing trend of particularly athletic males on the way to college scholarships that are that are being sextorted and are killing themselves as a result because they are afraid to say anything or, or to reach out to anybody for help. So as parents, we really have to not only be aware of what's happening through all these social medias and protect them from themselves, but also create an atmosphere where it's it's okay to say, I did something wrong. How do I how do I get out of this? I, I need help. You know, it, there has to be an openness to have those conversations with our kids or, or they're just going to continue to get exploited. And what are the, uh, the criminal implications there for somebody who's going to do something like that extortion, you know, like you're talking about? Mm -hmm. If somebody's charged with that, what are they looking at? So it depends on, on how much evidence there is and how deep they can go. I mean, it could be something as simple as, as blackmail or if we can follow the trail and prove that they turned around and sold it again, it, where we can get trafficking, uh, we've seen some cases go for 20, 30 years. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's the, you know, the victim that needs to be protected in these types of situations. And traditionally, you know, the criminal justice system is not good at actually coming up with punishment that mm -hmm. fits the crime. It's usually a lot less than it should be considering the damage that is done to somebody young, especially if there's, you know injury or suicide its results most state and federal laws particularly when we start looking at trafficking uh, or anything that's that's related to to sex uh, molestation assault carry significantly higher penalties if you are a minor uh, and in fact louisiana is is looking at adding the death penalty for some of those if you are under the age of 13 i believe right. wow. well so how prevalent yeah. is it here in san antonio it's it's pretty prevalent uh so case in point, we are working with uh, 215 cases right now. Uh, and we have also unfortunately had to wait list for a while. So that's that's what mostly because um, I, I only have so many advocates. And, and once our caseloads get super high, then it, I, it ends up being a disservice not only to the advocate, but also to the survivors that are on that caseload if I keep adding more. Uh, so we, we have had to wait list for a couple of months and are coming off of that with some additional hires. Uh, but Those but are yes. ones you guys have, but I'm talking Correct. about like criminal-wise, criminal well, how many cases are going on here in San Antonio area? In terms of prosecution? Yeah. Those numbers I don't have, but they're, they're pretty few and, and far between, in part because uh, the, the sad part of this is while we may be able to identify somebody who is trafficked, uh, identifying that is is a whole lot easier than than turning around and identifying their predator, building the case. It's it's not uncommon for it to take anywhere from two to four years to build the case. Uh, and if you don't have somebody who's willing to testify, that makes it a little bit harder too, because then you've got to find all the evidence to corroborate a story or or uh, the various issues that are there. We've had some great uh, successes within the last year or so. I, I want to say that there have been three or four different cases that, have, that again, took years to build, but were prosecuted, and I think the minimum sentence was about 25 years. Okay. Well, I mean, that's significant for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Definitely. I, I'm thinking here that uh, a lot of the time you're dealing with the, the consequence. Mm -hmm. How can you get to the root cause to prevent things? Is there any way of doing that, or is it just the way it is? Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do is just deal with the consequence. No, no, no. There's, there's definitely prevention methods that are out there. Uh, and there, there are a few organizations that are out here in San Antonio in particular that are doing some prevention work uh, in terms of getting out into schools and different areas uh, in order to, to um, educate better. Uh, we also have our own team that does a lot of uh, human trafficking education and awareness. Uh, and so helping in terms of those identifications is, is, is key, certainly. But the, the other aspect, a lot of research shows that the higher the level of, we call them ACEs, but it stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, the higher 
adverse childhood experiences a, a child has, the more at risk they are for exploitation. Uh, and that could be anything from uh, divorce, uh, abuse, neglect, um, yes, certainly economic standings, um, just you, there's a, a whole series of bullying, you know, a whole series of different things. A lot of it has to do, frankly, with um, a lack of self-confidence. You know, we, we've seen interviews with traffickers who say, I can go into a mall, see a girl kind of walking around by herself and go up to her and tell her that, you know, she just looks so pretty. And if she looks down at the ground and goes, no, I'm not, then I know I have her. But if she looks at me and says, thank you, I appreciate that, then I, I smile and I walk away because I can't get her. It's the people who have very low self-esteem that need somebody to fill that void. And they're the ones that are easier uh, to be able to recruit and, and then exploit because they don't have their own self-confidence. The, the research shows that having even one safe adult in a child's life who is willing to say, how you doing? What's going on? Are you okay? You know, check in on them, um, provide some stability in their life. Just one. That's all it takes. Uh, that can significantly reduce the impact even of an adverse childhood experience and thus reduce the level of potential exploitation. Sure. I suppose I'm thinking across San Antonio, it, it's um, a city of, that's pretty diverse mm -hmm. across the spectrum of demographics, wealth, et cetera. Um, there's probably a finite amount of work you can do on prevention because of resources. And I'm sure that you could sit here and go, actually, there's these various organizations that they all need additional resources, whether it's people to help funding, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but also ac across the city, then, I mean, there must be a need for just helping parents be better parents, helping um, restore stability back into the family environment again. Absolutely. That, that's a, a massive area. And mm -hmm. again, I presume that there's probably not enough resources to help in that education piece. Well, unfortunately, the, the, the need is always greater than the supply when it comes to this particular yeah. realm. Uh, we do have a, a mentorship style program uh, that, we, that we operate called Allies Peer Support. Uh, and that one we work with, obviously, a lot of the, the trafficking survivors themselves. But then we're also working or partnering with businesses. Uh, like, for example, we've partnered with Wells Fargo, who's helping to provide financial literacy training. We've partnered with Dress for Success, who's helping to provide uh, job resume skills and interview skills and, and outfits for an interview. And if they get the job, then then um, a few more outfits for, for the work world. The, the hardest piece, once you've been in the life, is that financial component. Because oftentimes, I either have zero credit because they were completely off the grid or they have destroyed credit because their trafficker utilized their information and ran up a whole bunch of credit cards, never paid anything, mm -hmm. defaulted on loans, all kinds of stuff. And so without having decent credit, you can't get a bank account. Without a bank account, you can't get a lease. You can't get a car. I mean, there's there's so many different hurdles and barriers and, and that makes life uh, infinitely more difficult and makes the idea of going back into the life thinking that you can do it for yourself rather than being run by a trafficker uh, infinitely more uh, appetizing. And, and so in order to prevent that, we are intentionally trying to find ways to, to give them more stability. So how about providing a story that, you know, from start to finish mm -hmm. that had a happy ending? Because I feel like you know, <laughs> the energy is a little you low need, here, you and need it's some like of that happy I know there's no, well, I understand. There's, well, it's not that I need it; it's that there's there's got to be examples there of are, it, right? There so are. back there is, to there is hope. <laughs> yeah, there is. There no, is there hope. absolutely is hope. We, um, in fact, we we have a survivor who, uh, when she first came to us, was still in the life. It took us a while to help her reach that decision to finally leave. We were able to restore her with a grandmother. And because um, yeah, her, her mom was, was not a healthy place for her, but her grandmother was. And uh, they were able to rebuild a relationship. Uh, she ended up in college on a scholarship oh. and uh, is graduated and is now working on a master's degree with the hope of going into social work so that she can turn around and help others. Uh, we have another case, who uh, an adult who uh, was being labor trafficked and... Um, 
we were able, he uh, was actually somebody who had come from out of country, uh, which one of, ironically, one of our few, I mean, we've worked with well over 2000 survivors in the last few years and maybe 30, 35 of them at this point, we've seen a few more recently, uh, have been foreign born. Uh, all the others are, are domestic, um, U.S. citizens or residents, because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's easier to uh, <laughs> unfortunately exploit your own rather than having to import you know, a product in. Uh, but this individual was a, a gentleman who, who came from uh, Central America, was being labor trafficked, uh, we were able to get him uh, the appropriate visa that allowed him to stay, uh, got him connected to, um, I'm completely blanking out, but UTSA has a kind of a, a business um, think tank of sorts, and they were able to work with him, so he created his own construction company and now is able to uh, provide for his own rent and take care of his family and uh, has his has his own business, and it seems to be doing fairly well. And that was actually here in San Antonio. Well, let's dig into that just a little bit, because sure. I want to understand. So he's he was in, he came into the United States under, like, illegally. He was smuggled in or something? Well, he didn't and realize was he it was illegal. So he came yeah. in what he thought was a work visa, only the company that brought him in didn't actually have a visa for him. And they took all of his documentation, and um, and then he was stuck. And, and so, yes, they were, they were using him for forced labor. And what was the labor? Construction. Was it? it was construction work. Okay. So he would go out and he would perform the mm -hmm. construction and then they would pay him little or nothing when he Correct. came back. But he was, how did they? But at the same time, building up, in essence, an indentured servitude. Like, yeah. like yeah. yes, we will pay for you, but we're also housing you. And, and so we're going to charge you. Mm -hmm. So while he may have had a we'll say a $2,500 paycheck, he might have gotten $50 so that he could go buy his own food. But at the same time, they were also billing him exorbitant amounts for his toiletries and his, and his overhead. What was the leverage though? We're going to call immigration and have you deported. Is that the leverage? That and the debt. Yes. Right. But I mean, the debt he could walk away from a run away or something, right? Except most cultures don't think about it in that term. Okay. You know, I think, um, not to be callous, but I think Americans are, are much better at walking away from debt than, than a lot of other countries. You know, when you have that obligation, and especially if, if there's the potential for shame associated with it, uh, there are a lot of other cultures that, that aren't as feel as safe as walking away. Because the, the other aspect is, um, particularly when you don't understand our our customs, our laws, um, a debt, for example, that you walk away from could be a prison sentence in another country. Here it's not. You know, it messes up your credit. Uh, and, and depending on the level of debt, then yes, you, you may have fines and other things that are, that are there. But, you know, back home, he would have been thrown in jail. And so thrown in jail for walking away from a debt here means he has no access to anybody. Uh, he can't help his family. He can't uh, contribute to what's happening back home. He can't contact them. So you've got isolation. Correct. The fear of shame. Correct. And then the fear of being deported. Or imprisonment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the fear of being imprisoned by our system, right? Correct. What about physical violence? Are you seeing that it, yes. as part of it? Uh, we we said we certainly do. Uh, it it depends on the scenario. Um, <laughs> we have in commercial sex, in particular, what's referred to as a gorilla pimp that tends to be very very abusive. Uh, that that does things through fear uh, and abuse, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, rather than what we refer to as the Romeo pimp, which does it in a push pull of a, of a romantic thing. Oh baby, you know, just do this. It'll get better. It'll get better. Uh, and then might have a, a spat of abuse, but then turns around and is very loving. And, 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 you know, one, one girl I talked to, um, had that Romeo pimp and, and when he would make it up to her, he'd go let her pick out a designer purse. And so when she left, she took all these different designer purses with her and little by little was selling them off. But every time she sold them, she would remember everything that she had to do to get that purse. And so it was real hard to I me mean, because even years later, that trauma bond to the purse because of what was required to get that purse 
made it very difficult for her to let go. Uh, now, do you have examples of, or like an example of one that didn't turn out well, right? I mean, somebody was maybe we've, we've brought had, over and it didn't... We've had several that have killed themselves. Okay. Uh, in fact, since I've been here, we've had at least 10 survivors who have either committed suicide or been murdered. So this is after they were removed from the situation. Then they, okay, but I'm talking about like still in this situation. Let's say they're, they haven't been removed. You guys find out later, hey, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. What's that situation like? Give me an example there. Very similar. Uh, I mean, because again, when we first get the referral, they're often still in the life. So they'll leave and we'll still work with them. And then they'll go back and we'll still work with them. You know, our model is designed to meet them wherever they are mm -hmm. uh, and and at any time. You know, so while we operate, for example, in Texas in, in 65 different counties, uh, even if they're outside of our jurisdiction, we will often travel if need be in order to meet them. Because of that, uh, our engagement rates are through the roof. Um, you know, statistically across, across the country, engagement rates usually are between 45 and maybe 50, 55 percent. Uh, we're over 90 percent. Define engagement. The rate at which you stay engaged, the 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 rate at which once it starts, that you connectiveness, continue. correct, All that right, that connectiveness. You. It's it's not uncommon, even when our survivors run, for them to still call us. Okay. It's not uncommon, uh, even if they drop off for a couple of months, for them to reach back out and say, you know, hey, Mr. Mark, uh, I'm back. I, I'm sorry, I dropped out of touch, but I'm back. You know, how to how do we reengage? Um, you know, and, and because of that, um, it gives us the ability to stay on top of what's happening in their lives, where they're located, how they're doing. A lot of what we do has to do with um, dealing with the various triggers you know, that, that that create trauma. You know, our our survivors aren't but leaving. Let me just that get back to that question. I want mm -hmm. to understand that if they stay in that environment, mm -hmm. what's the outcome if they don't leave? What's the outcome when they stay? Because we know if they do leave, they can have success or they can, sure. they're can. they committing suicide to some extent, right? I don't know what the percentages are there. But if they stay, what does that look like? Uh, those who are in the life uh, will often have anywhere from three to six abortions a year. They will deal with STDs. Uh, it's not uncommon to have problems with alcohol or drug abuse. Uh, it is... It, the the sex world is the number one target for serial killers because most of them are are considered throwaway individuals by today's society, and so if uh, a sex worker is killed, there's not generally a lot of investigation. Um, it's not uncommon as well for people who have abusive sexual preferences to uh, to intentionally target the sex world. Um, because then it's unknown and it stays that way uh, in terms of their their predilections. Um, so they they will deal with abuse. They will deal with with disease. They will deal with addiction. They will deal with um, potential um, uh, murder. And, and of course, they're being sexually assaulted multiple times a day. Are they committing day. suicide there too? Is that some? Yes. I'm just kind of curious there. And what about the construction life? Like the example that you gave, the construction mm -hmm. work is over. Yeah, he's trapped in this environment. But if he ends up staying there, what does that look like? Do they stay for years? Do they yes. end up going back to their country? What What's the outcome there if they're not brought out of it? it typically, they are uh, stuck there for years uh, and then often sold to other businesses and then just kind of keep going. And so unless they run on their own somehow, some way, um, they're, they're trapped. And that life, what does that life look like for them? It's just hard labor, real hard labor. And, and of course, uh, no income, no ability to improve yourself, no ability to, to provide assistance to anybody else. Um, no, unless your family is also there with you, there, there's no opportunity for family as well. Mm. Yeah, it's just. Are, are there particular, you mentioned construction. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's maybe the only industry that maybe is... Absolutely not. Okay. So are there a few key industries? And obviously, we want to Let's Talk Business podcast. So are there business owners in particular industries that should be aware of this? And what proactive measures should they be taking? So maybe a couple of bits mm -hmm. into that. Um, we see 
on the labor side, we we see it in restaurants, we see it in nail salons, massage parlors, uh, hotel industries. You know the the cleaning um, aspect in particular. Um, the obviously farm work, of course. Um, there we still have sweatshops. Yeah, you know, where where Here in San Antonio, of course. Well, I mean, they're they're kind of everywhere. Um, but but yes, absolutely. We we have communities. In fact, uh, one of your your colleagues recently took a, a tour uh, around San Antonio and discovered that the massage parlor just down from his own office was actually uh, one that was doing sex and labor uh, at the massage parlor. We refer to them as the illicit massage businesses. Uh, but but yes. There, there's um, quite a bit of that. Uh, you see it a lot, uh, honestly, in the in the strip clubs as well, where there's an overlap between sex and labor. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so th- those are probably the primary targets. And then, of course, there's the abuse of benefits. So, for example, um, an individual who is disabled that has Medicaid benefits coming in, uh, those can also be taken uh, by generally a relative, and then utilized for themselves rather than for the individual who the, those funds are supposed to be for. So like the, what did you call it, the massage parlor? What was mm-hmm. the... The illicit massage businesses? Yes. So what happened with that one that we you just figured out that that's what they're doing there? Are they shut down already? What, what they're happened? They're not. No. Uh, in fact, we have several around town, uh, and they're often under investigation, but, you know, again, it's, it's part of building that investigation and um, following the monies, creating the case. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the, the law enforcement that are in the area are specifically targeting those right now, but the other problem is they'll shut down and they'll pop up somewhere else just as quickly. And so then you got to start over again uh, unless you have the actual individuals. Uh, Texas has passed legislation that uh, will also make um, l- the landlords, uh, you know, people who own properties, business properties or own hotels where a lot of this is happening, will make them culpable for the activities that are happening if they are informed and they don't shut the business down themselves. Because you know, they obviously control the rent and or, or the lease and uh, virtually every every lease document that out there refers to no criminal activity happening. Uh, so if they are informed that criminal activity is happening on their property on a regular basis and they don't shut it down, then they can potentially be liable for that as well. So tell me a little about your uh, Survivor's Village. What is this? So with most of our programs, we are taking uh, somebody who's been exploited. They, you know, They are a victim. And through advocacy, through walking with them day in and day out, through being you know, their person, we, we hope to bring them from victim to, to survivor, right? Uh, but a survivor isn't enough. We want them to be thrivers. So through our allies' peer support, we're, we're surrounding others in the community, businesses, individuals, to help with everything from uh, GED training to uh, providing scholarships to go to tech schools and colleges to uh, we've got somebody now who's interested in, in helping uh, sponsor real estate licenses um, and also creating that safe adult as a mentor to help them move beyond being a survivor, uh, the victim and survivor, to being a thriver, to being able to step out on their own two feet, to, to walk in a world where they're constantly surrounded by triggers, but be able to handle those triggers. You know, because again, most of our victims are, are domestic. And so they're hearing the same music that they saw or, or, or heard while they were being exploited. They're seeing the same clothes, the same cars. They're in the same city. It, they may even run into somebody that purchased them at the grocery store because they're in the same city where they were sold. So it's the triggers are, are, are there. You know, um, but learning how to deal with that, how to how to develop their own self confidence, how to to know that there is a life after this, and be able to walk forward through that is 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 key. And so, yes, we are we are partnering with businesses and we are partnering with individuals to help build out that village to ensure that they um, feel supported and can walk out on their own. How do businesses get involved if they want to get involved? 
Uh, so there's a variety of things. Uh, one is uh, obviously the, like, for example, the financial literacy piece that I mentioned, uh, those who would be interested in being serving as mentors. Uh, we have other businesses that have volunteered, um, like they do a big volunteer day where they help us put together backpacks that create toilets that, that have a change of clothes and toiletries and uh, a few other things that we give to survivors. And because oftentimes when, when we first meet them, they're, they've they been recovered and so don't have anything but the clothes on their back with them. And and so providing them with that is, is often what we do. Um, we have other businesses that particularly during Thanksgiving and, and Christmas will donate meals or or turkeys you know, for the holidays. Um, others... Uh, in fact, we're partnering with the, the San Antonio airport right now, and they're doing um, a baby drive. So uh, baby clothes and, and items, because a lot of our survivors have kids of their own. Um, the, the other thing is most of what we do is funded via grants. And uh, part of particularly federal grants is, a re- is what's referred to as a match requirement. So... Um, that means that it's a kind of a public private partnership aspect where, where we have to put up some sort of in kind or cash contribution. Uh, cash is obviously always king, but what we're, we're really looking for now is reaching out into the business community to say, if you're a painter, would you be willing to do donate some time to paint a room so that it looks different than, than where they were potentially exploited? Um, would you be willing, if you are a, a tattoo parlor, to provide tattoo removal services? Because a lot of our uh, of our kiddos are branded with tattoos that, that are a form of ownership. And so to remove that also helps to remove that, that constant trigger that they're seeing. Or, or maybe even tattoo over it into something that, that is beautiful rather than what they, they see when they look at it. Uh, if you are... Uh, a retired teacher, would you be willing to help to some tutoring? You know, um, there's just virtually anything that's out there as far as a business, you know, whatever you can possibly imagine, there is an opportunity to be able to plug some of our survivors in, you know, for example, with, um, with, uh, call banks or, you know, any type of internship type of opportunity, learning about, AI and, and computer programming. You know, the, there's a variety of different ways that that um, we can plug our kiddos in and and get them some support that doesn't require a cash outlay, but yet provides so much uh, in terms of the benefit to the survivor, but also the benefit to enable us to to find uh, more grant funding and be able to expand programming to ensure that we reach more kiddos that are out there. Very so cool. Awesome. And if folks want to get in touch with you or the BCFS yes. Health and Human Services family, how do they do that? Well, the the easiest thing that I always recommend is, is people go check out our website because our website has a lot of resources on there in terms of learning more, not only about our various programming, but also about the issue, uh, as well as about uh, ways that you know, there might be threats to your kids through through the cyber world. And so I'm, I'm actually working on trying to build kind of a parent corner to, to help our parents out a little bit more, but our cyber section in particular is really good for that right now. Uh, and then of course we have, we have made ways of contacting us, uh, in terms of if you want to partner with us, if you want to sign an MOU, if you want to be a, a mentor, uh, there's, there's different means of contacting us there. And that website is bcfstrafficking.org. Awesome. And then, of course, I can always be reached via email at cm6861 at bcfs.net. All right. Well, thank you, Kara. Thank you. We appreciate you coming in. All right. As we wrap up the show, quick reminder to check out our latest podcast and catch video versions of the show anytime by visiting our website at satalkradio.com. That's going to be it for this one. You guys have a great week. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you.